one analogy you can maybe think of is like the the government regulating radio spectrum the point of that regulation and charging for spectrum is not actually for the government to like to take in revenues i mean that that's a, a great side product but they actually need to carve out specific regions and make make that non-contentious so that the radio spectrum is actually functional for commercial and, and public interest. All right, everyone, we will be back to the program in just a moment. But before we do, I want to share something that Blockworks has been cooking up for these last couple of months. March of this coming year in London, Blockworks is hosting DAS London, the largest institutionally focused conference in all of crypto. Goldman, JP Morgan, 0.72, all in one room so you can know what the big money is doing. So click the link at the bottom of this episode. It'll take you right over to the homepage and use Bell20 for 20% off. I will see you in sunny London town in March. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Bell Curve. Before we jump in, quick disclaimer, the views expressed by my co-host today are their personal views and they do not represent the views of any organization with which the co-hosts are associated with. Uh, Nothing in the episode is construed or relied upon as financial, technical, tax, legal, or other advice. You know the deal. Now let's jump into the episode. All right, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Bell Curve. Today, I'm joined by Pranav Garimidi of A16Z and Sam Hart of Skip. Guys, welcome to the show. Hi. Thanks for having me. Great to talk about a few markets. Yeah. Happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah. This is a this is a fun episode. This is going to be hitting folks um, when they're most likely in between their sort of Christmas and New Year's holidays. And, uh, you know, we can leave you without content. So we wanted to discuss i've honestly i've been this episode sam knows has been building for a little while it's been sort of a passion passion project um but i want to talk about fee markets because i feel like they're extremely critical when it comes to um being a component of different blockchains and they're not particularly well covered or even invested in from sort of technical resources from various foundations so you know we're gonna sort of just give you a a basic overview of what it is that it means when we talk about fee markets and their various components actually going to take you through the development of uh, fee markets in major blockchains, sort of the earth, uh, the early, first early primitive of uh, Bitcoin fee markets, uh, 1559 in Ethereum, and then kind of take you through to Solana and some of the interesting questions that they're starting to ask around rejiggering their fee market. And then finally, explore some very kind of cool new themes like multidimensional fee markets or fee credits that are being explored in different ecosystems. So uh, before we get to all of that, uh, you know, Pranav or Sam, whoever wants to take this, can you guys just give us sort of an overview and a definition of what it means when we talk about a fee market within a blockchain? Yeah, I'm I'm happy to take that. We have a we have a Christmas present for the listeners. Uh, the most boring subject in in blockchains. <laughs> um, this is a podcast for nerds, my man. Yeah. So the it's interesting the the kind of origin story of the term fee market uh, obviously comes from from Bitcoin. Um, the role that the fee market plays in Bitcoin um, encompasses a, a couple different things. So um, the idea uh, is, is that users want to um, transact on the network. They want to submit transactions. Um, they typically submit them to the miners. Um, although the miners may not be the one who select the block. So uh, they want to circulate the transactions and there's this, uh, this kind of cooperative process of distributing transactions throughout um, throughout the miner network, um, and the uh, the fee market is the process by which miners um, would take in transactions and include them in in the block. Uh, so it's a the fee that's included uh, along with the user transaction um, to the miner um, that uh, allows them to to select. Um, those transactions for inclusion. Um, however, the the role that um, the fee market has played and, and kind of how it's conceptualized has, has changed a bit. So, for anyone familiar with like Ethereum fee markets or Solana fee markets, like that definition doesn't quite um, jibe. And uh, what it's what's kind of come to mean is a way to price network resources, um, and uh, it it touches on um, a kind of ephemeral resource, which is block space or, or inclusion um, within the block. Yeah, I think maybe to add a bit in that, I think the way I think about fees is for first reason of like why you can have fees. It really comes down to the fact that just block space is scarce in the first place. And so if you imagine we had infinite compute, 
we get to every transaction on chain. Then it would actually be fine if we had zero fees. But really, there's like a core economic problem you have to solve of we have lots of people who have transactions that want to land on chain, but different blockchains can only handle so much throughput. So you have to somehow solve this problem of like what transactions actually land up in a block. And kind of the most natural way to do that is just via charging fees. And you know, as we'll probably get into, there's lots of ways you can do this. Um, but in some sense, kind of like the amount of users willing to pay for a transaction in some sense correlates to like how economically valuable the transaction is um, in terms of the overall blockchain. And so these have kind of grown and evolved in some way, just like kind of solve this core economic coordination problem of how do we decide which transactions actually should land on chain? Yeah, I, I think, you know, that's just a very good uh, summary, uh, both uh, Sam and Pranav there. But maybe to just like describe how fees I feel like are sometimes normally talked about is you've probably seen something like a PL of Ethereum. And people talk about fees as being revenue for the network. Um, I have sort of an opinion on that framing. How appropriate is it, you know, to view fees as revenue for these networks? Yeah, it's a good question. It, it's hard to answer. Um, the from the protocol designers perspective um i i don't think that they are necessarily intended to be revenues um however when you look at bitcoin uh the long-term security budget of the network is dependent on fees at least notionally that that's what they're trying to achieve so there is in in that case um a connection between the the fee revenue or the, the fees taken in um, and the sustainability of the network, uh, but the miners are the ones that are are receiving those fees directly. Um, so the the Bitcoin network itself is is kind of a pass through. Um, it's really concerned with operator sustainability. Yeah, I think one tricky thing with this question is that defining who the network even is is a bit tricky. Of like. Um, is the network all token holders? Is it all stakers? Is it validators? And so like in practice, the way fees have evolved, it's, there's lots of decisions you have to make about who fees go to exactly. And so I think there's like two different ways you can think about fees. And like at one extreme, it's like literally just at a single block level of like next block is going to be proposed. In Ethereum, you have 12 seconds. We have to decide what transactions get in. We want to have payments to facilitate that coordination. And then like you can kind of forget about the long scale effects. On the other end of the extreme is kind of, okay, let's look at how much we're charging, you know, over a hundred blocks, a thousand blocks over a few days, how much are we burning? What is the actual kind of like, how are the fees playing with the monetary policy in some sense of the kind of network as a whole and token as a whole? And so I, I think those two questions are kind of related, um, but the kind of goals you want from them are not necessarily the same, kind of require different ways of thinking about them to figure out what you want. Yeah, I think one theme of this, especially when we get to 1559, is maybe the rewriting of narratives, I would say. And uh, I think originally how fees were thought of, especially in the proof of stake context, and Sam, this very interesting sort of, uh, there's, there maybe have a different, slightly different function in a proof of work network like Bitcoin is proof, as opposed to proof of stake. But it's, it's really rate limiting, right? It's, it's sort of spam prevention, um, you know, denial of service attack prevention. Because block space is a scarce resource, which is dependent on this shared network of different, uh, you know, basically computing computing hardware. So to make sure that people aren't flooding the network with spam transactions, then you have the concept of fees. And so somewhere along the line that got rewritten as this is the the revenue of the network and people construct Ethereum PLs. And to me, that just doesn't make an enormous amount of sense because as you rightly point out, it's hard to even define who the network really is is. And actually, Miles and I, you know, who's a co-host on this program, pretty often we have these debates and our analysts debate about it all the time. But probably the my current method of thinking is if block space is a commodity, then that's something like oil. You would never call oil having a PL. There are sets of actors that are involved in the oil ecosystem that have uh PLs uh, that depend on the price of oil, but ultimately oil in itself or ETH block space in itself can't really have revenue. So I feel like that's a little bit, a little bit of a reframing away from its original intention, which is spam prevention. Totally. Um, one, one analogy you can maybe think of is like the, the government regulating radio spectrum, like the point of that regulation and charging for spectrum is not actually for the government to like 
to take in revenues. I mean, that, that's a, a great side product, but they actually need to carve out specific regions and make, make that non-contentious so that the radio spectrum is actually functional for commercial and, and public interests. Yeah, I, mean, I think we're seeing this even as Ethereum is evolving today of like kind of different discussions around MEV burn and this type of stuff of kind of trying to almost in sense like normalize the amount of like transaction fees and kind of like application level level like kind of fees that go to validators and almost in some idea, I mean, you can argue about what the ideal thing is here, but one thing you can imagine is if you want to actually have like a fixed reward to certain participants in network that shouldn't be kind of probabilistic then you want this kind of variability to all be burned. And in some sense, that is revenue towards like holders, but it gets a lot more complicated. And it's really just, I think there's different ways you can redistribute kind of the gains from trade to some extent, different parties, depending on what goals you're trying to achieve. Yeah. And I think this framing is important because there's a, there's a pretty longstanding debate on within crypto about fees. And it, this typically comes down to, or at least in the current moment, it's like, are the high fees on Ethereum bad? And you get, there are sort of two camps. And in my opinion, they sort of talk past one another. And in the one camp is, look, high fees mean high demand. Um, and then they, you know, usually like revenue for the network is kind of brought in and like, that's ultimately a good thing. And then there's this other camp of, hey, this actually isn't a good thing at all. Really what users want is low fees. And eventually people are going to move off this sort of high fee environment. And I, I have kind of thoughts on this before we get into uh, sort of our history in 1559 example, but you know, where do you, where do the two of you sort of fall within this debate or how do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think for me, it's um, to define what's good and bad, you really do have to kind of first define what your objectives and mechanism are, right? So in some sense, if you do want like the highest secured kind of block space that you can totally rely on to some extent, um, then like maybe that is like high fees is the cost of that of like you do have to actually pay some parties to be incentivized to be providing the service to some extent and like in that case maybe high fees really makes a lot of sense but in other cases if you do want just users to be submitting kind of simple transactions that don't require the same level of guarantees in the block space to perform well and you really just want like clean ux then low fees do make sense and so I think there's different environments where saying high fees and low fees are better or worse. I mean, I think in general, like you can say lower fees are better, but that comes with trade-offs of like, if you are having less revenue with certain parties, then those parties are less incentivized to invest in certain infrastructure to kind of ignore malicious attacks and kind of all these types of things. And so I, I think you have to just be very careful what exactly the trade-offs you want and adjust what you think is optimal based off that. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um... In, in Bitcoin, fees are, are kind of intrinsically connected to security um, because they they have kind of committed to not having perpetual issuance. Um, and you could imagine issuance being modulated uh, such that um, you always know that the operators of the network are going to be sufficiently compensated. Um, and other networks have, have tried to decouple those things. Um, they have other objectives potentially, um, maybe they have different kind of uh, resources available. Um, maybe they have different application behavior. Uh, maybe they want to subsidize um, fees early on in order to um, uh, to acquire users. Um, so there's you you may even change kind of your your outlook on fees um, as the the network matures. So. There's a lot that kind of goes into into that one number. If you, yeah, one one other one other um, framework that at least I've been thinking about it recently is there's an element of almost like deadweight loss optimization. I think, and here's like a sort of a silly analogy that is sort of imperfect, but if you think about uh, a blockchain as uh, as like a factory, as like a resource that's sort of fixed. And what you're trying to do if you have a factory is you're trying to, you have a target utilization, right? Uh, for your resources within the factory. It's probably not 100% because then if there's any fluctuation in demand, you're kind of shit out of luck. So maybe, you know, different factories might have different utilization targets of say 85%, something like that. So, okay, in this instance, are, are really high fees good? 
well, it means you have a lot of demand for your factory. But on the other hand, it means you're probably surrendering some demand, right? There's probably a lot of demand that you're not ultimately satisfying. If fees are super low, well, guess what? Your factory probably isn't viable over a long period of time and you're going to be flooded with tons of useless stuff. So I, I would almost use that as like a mental model of having this scarce fixed resource. And there's a there should be almost like a target utilization, most likely. And and maybe that's going to lead us into 1559, actually. And 1559 is like an extremely interesting period, I would say, in overall crypto development. I think outside of the merge, it was probably the largest, single largest upgrade or update to a blockchain. And uh, it, it's just very interesting historically. So maybe um, I'd love to actually start with the Sam, you were giving us a little bit of an overview of the the fee market in in Bitcoin. But if you could just kind of rehash for listeners, like how did the, the fee market in Bitcoin work? And then let's take us through to how it initially worked in Ethereum and why, uh, you know, we started to talk about 1559 as this big overall. Yeah, happy to. So I mentioned that um, there's this thing, the mempool, which is kind of this, uh, this subjective view of transactions that um, a miner or, or a validator has um, that they can, they can pull from in order to include transactions in the block. And um, they need to apply some um, local rule to include transactions. And so in Bitcoin, the, um, the way that um, miners select the transactions that are in the block is they look at the, the transactions with the highest fees. And then those fees go to the miner. Um, so that is their, uh, their payment for creating creating the block, um, particularly in, in this kind of like perpetuity case where the, um, the issuance is uh, diminished. So that model was, um, well, there's a couple things about that, about Bitcoin that, that are worth understanding. One is that um, because Bitcoin is, is sufficiently constrained in what it can do, um, you can basically just transfer tokens around. Um, they, uh, we had said previously that like fees are, are, are kind of a way to price resources. Well, all the resources, um, or the utilization of those resources looks very consistent. Um, you're making a transaction, uh, and so you don't, you, you actually kind of know ahead of time, like how much it's going to cost the network for an individual transaction. Um, and. Uh, so the, there's no notion of um, you, you don't have to have a, a, like an, a resource abstraction itself. Um, you don't have to kind of name that resource. When you move into Ethereum, you're going into this kind of generalized uh, platform where you can do smart contracts. You can really do any kind of programmable logic. And you, uh, this requires the introduction of something called gas. And gas is a really... Uh, kind of squishy um, object. It is really a, a kind of composite of many different resources that exist in the network. Um, so that's like uh, network bandwidth, uh, network storage, computation. Um, there's actually a couple different flavors of storage that are included there. Um, and basically uh, those are all kind of combined in a somewhat magical way to, um, to create uh, a, a a single like unit gas and any computation um, uh, will will utilize gas. Um, so uh, to perform a transfer in Ethereum, it costs X amount of gas. Uh, however, the um, the what you pay in Ethereum is not gas; it is ETH, right? You pay ETH to transact on the network, and so there needs to be a um, an exchange, exchange rate between uh, gas and ETH. Um, so this is what's called the gas price. Um, and this is kind of the, uh, um, this is the, the core uh, variable in, um, in EIP 1509, um, as well as the, the, the former um, fee market in, in Ethereum. Basically, where Ethereum started was by copying Bitcoin one to one with this one kind of um, change uh, with the introduction of gas. And then as the network kind of uh, was 
sufficiently utilized, we, we kind of discovered additional dynamics that uh, like emergent behavior, um, which a lot of it has to do with the applications that are built on top. Um, and, um, and it was kind of one of the things that if you were transacting on the, the Ethereum network that you would, you would realize is that um, uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, so three years ago, if you're, you're trying to use the Ethereum network, um, you would submit a transaction and you'd you know, be kind of like guided by MetaMask. You'd submit it and then, then you'd wait like 10 minutes and you'd just be kind of in this limbo place where you don't know what's going on. Like it was horrible. Uh, it's it just sucked. out there somewhere. Is it ever going to land? And then, and then you would, there was like an advanced uh, menu where you could like resubmit with like a different nonce in order to kind of like override, but then you didn't know if like your first transactions are going to make it in before the other things are just like really, really just head scratching. Um, and it, it was, it was terrible UX. So it just like did not feel good. Um, it was, it was it was clearly not the future of finance um and so that was really the core issue that eip 1559 was trying to solve was um was uh giving users additional certainty that they were going to make it in the block um within a reasonable amount of time um and uh and being able to select a price that was just okay this is what it, what it costs i can read it off the network it's telling me this. If I submit this, I think I'm going to get in the next block or two blocks, or you know, and that's sufficient for me. I just yeah, so I just want to underscore that for folks who might not have been around or transacting on chain or using Ethereum uh, three years ago, like just exactly how bad it was. I know you just kind of gave this example, but yeah, you would log on, you know, you, you sort of have your MetaMask and you want to trade something on Uniswap, and there was a there was a mechanism right, which is basically like a first price auction where you could. You, you had to select how much gas you wanted to to pay, essentially. And you got no guidance, right? Usually the way that this would work in practice is, at least this was what it was for me when I was trying to do my first swaps, is I talked to a friend. I was like, hey, how much like gas should I be giving? And someone would tell me something and I would just put that much gas. <laughs> like that's such a hilariously bad user experience uh, because you had no information about whether or not that was good or bad. You know, there was real surges in demand where and sometimes like you could pay X amount of gas and it would actually work. Uh, sometimes it just wouldn't work. You'd have no idea why. Uh, you were paying an enormous amount in gas fees that for transactions that weren't even landing. Um, and so I think that idea of copy pasting the mechanism uh, that administered the fee market and priced resources from Bitcoin to Ethereum is the thing to underline here. So obviously, Ethereum is a very different has a very different value proposition. It's a general smart contracting platform. There's much more that you can do with it, but it introduces a very difficult pricing and optimization problem around resources that Bitcoin doesn't necessarily have. So we had kind of a first whack at the apple with our uh, you know, first price auction. That didn't really work as a mechanism. And to your point, Sam, I think in when was probably, I mean, I know you were involved, but 2020 sort of timeframe said, hey, we need a major user experience update. The UX, uh, just to again, underscore, was the that was the main driver for why we needed one five five nine? So walk us through. Like I think people when they think about one five five nine today would be like, yeah, the token burn and ultrasound money, right? That's what people sort of think about. But um, you know, walk us through like what were some of the early conversations around UX in one five five nine? And I got to shout out Tim Roughgarden, who's basically holding up the entire burden of producing content around fee markets on his on his shoulders here. But walk us through kind of the innovations, like the three different innovations, I suppose, or features that 1559 introduced. Yeah, just just before that, I, I feel like it is worth mentioning that um, because Ethereum also introduced the full programmability, what that also created was state contention in a way that um, Bitcoin did not have. Mm. Um, so uh, this is kind of adjacent to fees, but it, uh, historically, basically the network started getting used more and more. And um, this problem of like waiting for fees was exacerbated by uh, what were called priority gas auctions. And um, when there was an NFT drop or like someone was using a DEX or whatever, um, basically this is MEV, like early MEV, um, 
the user experience would just degrade entirely. So um, the the way that validators would or miners at the time would select transactions would would be based on on the, the fee. Um, they would get the fee, and um, they the the mempool would just be flooded with um, these iterative bids that were for trading on DEXs specifically. And it would just mean that a normal user would have no idea what's going on and, and just be kind of waiting there for, for minutes, you know, who knows how long. Yeah, yeah. Just one first point that I think it points out like a very interesting thing where there's kind of like two things fees do. Like the first is guarantee inclusion to some extent. And the other thing is also kind of guarantee priority for state. And so I appreciate that, like it's very tricky to make the same fee mechanism do both things. Like kind of optimizing for one necessarily almost degrades the experience for the other. But if you like kind of design your fees in a way where people can express very fine grained preferences over, I want exactly like the third transaction in the block or something or something like this, then it makes the people who are just kind of making bids or submitting fees for that I just want to express, I want to get inside of a block kind of tricky to interpret what else is happening in that same block. For example, you know, if like four people are submitting, I only want to be included like only in the third spot. And those are all the fees there. And as a user who just wants to get inclusion, if I see all those fees, I now have to interpret, oh, it actually, that's not actually four transactions taking a block space. Maybe it's only one that the block producer will include or something. And so I think that's kind of why on the Ethereum side, we've seen this part of fees move off chain for the most part of kind of this is what's been happening with PBS and kind of builders and proposers doing all this type of stuff is basically um, you kind of, and that's one of like the early goals of Flashbots is to just make this kind of auctions for state contention happen off chain and let the fee mixing itself kind of only happen or only kind of worry about inclusion. And so I think that is kind of to start talking about the IP159, that is kind of the guarantee it gives you. It doesn't give you any kind of guarantee really over, even though there are ways to access priority freeze, there's no kind of explicit guarantee that, oh, if you submit a much higher fee, you're going to get higher in the block, right? And so I think when I'm thinking about um, fees, there's kind of two main um, important properties of the first one, um, kind of in the academic literature we call DSIC, which basically stands for dominant strategy and sense of compatible. And this basically says from a user's point of view, if they value a transaction getting included, I'd say X dollars, then they can simply p tell the mechanism, I'm willing to pay up to X dollars for this transaction. And game theoretically, that's the best th they can do. And that doesn't mean they'll always be charged X dollars, they'll actually be charged much, much less usually. It just basically means that it's very easy for the user to interact with the protocol from a game theory point of view. And so in this prior world where we effectively had these first price auctions kind of happening, this wasn't the case, right? From the game theory perspective from a user, you're kind of trying to do this calculus in your head of, oh, you know, I don't want to pay that much, but maybe I won't get included. So maybe I'll pay a bit more and kind of like work out for yourself what the minimum amount you're kind of willing to take a risk on is for kind of how much money you might save by not bidding too high. And so kind of one primary goal of EIP-1559 is that that shouldn't be the case. The kind of, you see this base fee, you place that base fee, you know, you should basically get included. There's no game theory in the user's part. The other important part is that um, what was previously called MMIC and has been called kind of MIC and I recently called BPIC in a recent paper of mine, um, is basically just saying that the block producer, the person kind of running this mechanism uh, should be kind of have their incentives aligned to run this mechanism correctly. Okay. It's all well and good to have this like kind of very nice mechanism that from a user's point of view, like looks great. But if the person running the mechanism, in this case for Ethereum, is the person constructing the blocks, the proposer it, it gets more messy these days, but kind of, you know, going back to when 1559 was first introduced, at least the, like kind of the miner creating the block, you know, if they aren't incentivized to actually follow the protocol as stated, and if they start kind of messing with the, the game through the mechanism, kind of all the guarantees can break down. Um, so that's the second thing that's also very important for the person running the mechanism to actually want to run the mechanism in the proper way. And then there's also kind of a third goal of the AP1559, which is called uh, OCA proofness, which stands for off-chain agreement kind of proofness. And the idea here is that, you know, if your mechanism is kind of doing this very suboptimal stuff, like, you know, kind of these first two properties, you can trivially guarantee in some like kind of weird mechanisms of say like, oh, you know, we'll always randomly select what transactions get included and kind of like, you know, this kind of trivial stuff that obviously be really bad. 
kind of this third property says basically that there should be no way for the people participating in the mechanism, in this case would be kind of the users and the block producer, to basically just do something else off chain, make some agreement off chain and say, you know, we'll just like post all those bids on chain or like kind of, they'll post some different bids on chain, um, but in reality kind of will like just guarantee this allocation that's been kind of given off chain. And so it's kind of like a, a form of collusion proofness of saying there shouldn't be ways for groups people to kind of collude off chain and through some tricky way bypass the mechanism. And so kind of, or it turns out with these three constraints that EIP-159 is kind of almost the best you can do in this setting. Um, and kind of it actually manages to do a very good job of kind of targeting all three of these concerns and um, yeah, make, making a feasible mechanism that kind of gets all the properties you'd want. Yeah. So, so just to sum up, you know, basically when you're designing one of these mechanisms, you're doing it in an extremely adversarial environment. And there are all these game theory uh, considerations that you have to take into account when you're designing it to make sure that it doesn't get abused in various ways. And so to summarize, and I'll, I'll turn it over to you, to you here, Sam, the, the basic components from how I understand 1559 is the introduction of a base fee. Right. So instead of instead of, uh, you know, before where you had to guess the amount of gas, you were just told in your meta, like right now, if you trade on Ethereum, you're told like this is what the base fee is going to be. Um, that base fee, one of the big uh, changes of 1559 as well is you made blocks dynamic in size. Right. So there's kind of a target and an actual amount of gas. The actual is twice the amount that, that, that the target is. Uh, and so basically what you get with this um, sort of dynamically adjusting base fee is you get an on-chain sort of um, indicator for demand for block space, which is also extremely useful. Um, and then finally, what you have is a, a sort of first price auction that's layered on top of that so that you can still express this preference of like, I want to get included first. And one of the also the, the other extremely important components that we'll, we'll talk quite a bit about because I feel like it co-opted the narrative a little bit is this idea of the burn. So the burn... Um, which I think now has been sort of understood as this like ultrasound money revamping of Ethereum's tokenomics. It was actually to prevent this exploit and make it game theory compatible, which is basically that let's say if the the amount of gas was going to be $90, right? Uh, $90 equivalent in GUI. Uh, what you could do very easily is to create some sort of off-chain agreement between the, mi the uh, miner at the time, I guess now a validator, and so whoever's going to pay and said, look, I know that I'm being quoted on chain 90, $90 equivalent here, but I really want to pay $60. So you just rebate me the $30. And so by burning that fee instead, um, what you actually do is like the fee's got to be burned. So there's really no reason to do it off chain. Now, I would say, interestingly, I think to, to make this, I can't, I can't remember which one, um, which game theory component compatible, but you, it, the only thing that it dictates would be that the current uh, miner of the block doesn't get the payment. So there were talks in 1559 to like pay the next uh, miner or validator or something like that. We didn't have to go down this burn route. That was just one way to make it compatible. Um, but it is interesting because that's what we ended up settling on. Um, yeah, I don't know, Sam, if you have anything to add there. No, that, that was a great explanation. I mean, really, really well elaborated, Mike. Um, yeah, the burn is just like a direct consequence of this desire to have a base fee. Um, you don't want an off-chain agreement because it doesn't allow you to have this property where you can read off an accurate uh, measure of, um, of demand pricing. Um, and so you, you really need to like have the primary market exist on-chain um, so that the burn um, prevents the off-chain agreement. Uh, the market is now on chain, and and now you can use the the base fee as a um, uh, an accurate representation um, to kind of compute the next um, uh, the the price to be included in the next block. Um, yeah, so like you're saying, the, the these three components kind of like work in harmony to uh, to allow you to have um, both. Uh, equilibrium behavior that that is um, you know, has good UX and uh, predictability and um, kind of consistency and um, prevents some of the the adversarial behavior where um, uh, there would be off-chain agreements or uh, 
or mispricing that would that would kind of degrade um, the, the quality of the mechanism. All right, everyone, we will be back to the program in just a moment. But before we do, I want to share something that Blockworks has been cooking up for these last couple of months. March of this coming year in London, Blockworks is hosting DAS London, the largest institutionally focused conference in all of crypto. We are gathering 1,200 of the world's largest asset managers. So think TradFi macro funds, crypto native funds, big allocators, and financial institutions. So banks, payment processors, etc. all in one spot. It's very rare to get the likes of Goldman, JP Morgan, 0.7 to whatever all in one room so you can know what the big money is doing. We're diving into the themes that they care about. So we're talking about the intersection of macro and crypto, where we are in the cycle, real world assets. So everything from stable coins to on-chain treasuries to tokenized assets, it's going to be a blast. But the other reason you really want to go is London, baby, center of the world. At one point, you got pub culture, you got fish and chips, great beer. It's going to be a blast. So because you're such great listeners to Bell Curve, there's a code BELL20 that's going to get you 20% off. So click the link at the bottom of this episode. It'll take you right over to the homepage. You'll see all of our speakers and use Bell 20 for 20% off. Ticket prices are going up soon. Make sure you go use that code. I will see you in sunny London town in March. One of the interesting things that I feel like I'm honestly surprised that it ended up getting passed with this was the idea of burning revenue to miners, which at the time must have seemed just really funny because that was that was their entire revenue source. And I went back and listened to a couple of the the Tim Roughgarden episodes that he produced, and you know he said actually what people really wanted was like some sort of studies uh, to make sure that this mechanism is compatible, and then all their revenue isn't going to go away. And I don't have these stats offhand, but clearly, you know, miner Ethereum miners and proposers have done extremely well in the post one five five nine era, and that's from you know increasingly the desire to bid for. Um, you know, state where there's quite a bit of contention. Uh, so that we're starting to get into MEV land. But yeah, I just, yeah. it's just very interesting that that passed, frankly, there, looking back. Totally. I So I was in this like very early group chat that was talking about VIP 1509. And for like a year and a half, it was just completely hopeless. It was like, we're doing this, talking about this mechanism, how we're going to test it, whatever. And everyone was just like, yeah, this is, this is, an uphill battle. Um, one of the things that, one of the kind of social dynamics that was really useful here, I, I guess, in, in getting it passed, um, was uh, the plan was for the Ethereum network to fire all miners eventually. Um, so the uh, the ultimate responsibility uh, really lied with a set of participants that didn't exist yet. Um, who didn't really have a voice in in the decision. Um, miners were still pissed, but uh, it was kind of tolerated, um, particularly because MEV revenue was like was popping. It's it's just an interesting. I completely forgot about that dynamic. That yeah, Ethereum was about to fire its miners, transition to proof of stake, which makes it in some ways easier, but also in some ways even more complicated because you're dealing with this. And that that is, I think, when it comes to fee markets, why it's so. It's necessary to upgrade at times, but it's so difficult because it's just a redistribution of value that the system is ultimately creating, even if it's a UX upgrade for all. You know, one, one thing that's also interesting that maybe I could just point out and would love to get your guys' response to is even in real time, if you go back, I don't know if there are other nerds like me, I like to go back and listen to podcast episodes from previous periods of time. It's just very interesting to see how people were thinking about an idea and how it might have changed over time. It gives you good views into the zeitgeist of different eras. And you can go back and listen to early 1559 episodes, and they talk about it from this UX upgrade perspective. And it was, hey, this is unusable. This would be really great for the users, yada, yada. And then I think as the burn mechanism became the preferred mechanism for prevent making it game theory compatible, uh, people started to talk less about the UX part and more about the burn. And it started to shift into this discussion of tokenomics and ultrasound money. And the narrative was sort of rewritten in real time. And you can go back and listen to podcasts over the, this happened over about a six month time period. And it's really fascinating. And I would love to get the, from your guys sense, like how much do you agree with that sort of narrative, you know, at the, in the current moment in time, is that ultimately a good thing for Ethereum to be talking about it as a revamp of tokenomics or in your mind is this just this was ultimately a ux and a fee fee market change and we kind of uh, lost the message a little bit yeah at least for me i think of it mainly as a fee market change um and kind of 
the impact that it has in the actual long-term cryptonomics isn't even kind of well-defined. Like there's different instantiations of how this could play out where it's not actually necessarily being deflationary. It's just like kind of how the parameters have played out over time is like, this is what's happened. Um, you know, like if the demand goes down, then like, you know, it's still inflationary. So I think it's like in the kind of short run, just designing this mechanism, at least personally, is a mainly like a UX thing, mainly just like a get the game through incentives really right to make this like a really robust mechanism, kind of just block by block by block. And then long-term dynamics are always really hard to predict. And I think, yeah, narratives change and people care about different things, but I definitely view it as more of a game theory UX thing than a tokenomics thing. Yeah, I can add a couple of notes on this. Uh, there was some discussion of like sending the fee revenue to a like public goods DAO, and that was like batted down because kind of it was thought that, uh, or that there was certain actors who thought that that was going to be like just a whole kind of corruptible, um, not partisan uh, entity. Um, so it, it kind of ruined the, the credible neutrality of the system. Um, in Cosmos, people are just kind of do whatever. So like a lot of the, the talk is about like, yeah, let's, let's put it into a, a treasury and do something with it. Um, so, um, I, I believe near also does, uh, they have EAP one five of nine, um, and they, uh, burn half of it and put half of it into a treasury. So there, there's like a lot of different flavors to this. Um, you could also distribute it. Uh, evenly among all validators, um, that that's an option. Um, although there's like some computational constraints around that. Um, so yeah, there's there's some interesting things that you could do um, with regard to the uh, de deflationary aspect. Um, yeah, I mean it, it certainly just came out of nowhere at the time. Um, I can say one of the things that was nice about EIP one five of nine is like. When you contrast it with Bitcoin, you you could imagine like validators actually having a, a lot more certainty around their revenues um, because you're getting it from the inflation rather than this like spiky, inconsistent, probably kind of hard to model like uh, fee fee intake. Um, so that was good, but um, the the yeah the the actual protocol. Um, using as, this as a way to like decrease supply. I, um, I don't know, I, I, I'm not as uh, married to that concept. Um, I, if I'm being honest, like the, I, this seems to be kind of lost. The, people aren't, aren't actually talking about the, the issuance policy of Ethereum at all. I don't think many people could even reel off what that is, but um, that is the dominant um, uh, determinant of the n amount of ETH in circulation. So, like, you kind of want like a more holistic view of um, how how ETH is created and destroyed together. Yeah, I don't want to go too far off on this, but there's. I think I do think that this topic is going to re-enter the vogue in general this year. And uh, yeah, it's, I think the, I actually just came off of a predictions episode. I, I personally, you know, I don't mean this to sound like it is an attacking sort of way. I've never been a fan of the ultrasound money narrative. I actually think ETH gets a new narrative uh, this year was a prediction. Um, and that doesn't have to be a bad thing, by the way. Bitcoin has gotten many narratives over the years. I actually think it's a sign of strength, right? Ultimately, we're, we've invented a new commodity, which is block space, and people are still people are going to try to jam it into a whole bunch of different things. I've always thought it was like a little, we read a little too much into like, is this money or a commodity? Like, it's just useful. But um, but I do I do think that ETH gets maybe a, a new narrative this year around ultrasound money. I, I want to move on to Solana. And Solana is obviously a much newer blockchain than certainly Bitcoin and Ethereum as well. It has a very different uh, construction, both in terms of how it thinks about hardware or, uh, validator costs and hardware requirements, the role of the validator, the way uh, they come to consensus as opposed to like continuous versus discrete block building and have kind of an entirely different North Star. And I think one of the uh, one of the upcoming challenges is I think the Solana community is generally starting to think about 
maybe to confront the idea that the way that they price resources internally, their fee market is not at its end state and that there needs to be an improvement. And it's starting to heat up as kind of a spicy issue within the Solana community. So Pranav, can you give us an overview, maybe just for folks who might be a little bit less familiar with how Solana works under the hood, no need to go super in the weeds, but just a just a little bit about how Solana is different from Ethereum, and then give us a state of the overview of the fee markets today and, and where it might be broken. Yeah, so I, I think the main relevant differences between Solana and Ethereum in terms of fees is the first thing is that you're forced to declare kind of access lists up front of um, for every transaction in Solana. You have to list kind of every account that transaction might interact with. And if the transaction doesn't interact, or if the transaction tries to interact with an account that's not as part of that list, then it will be invalid. And the reason for that is basically that Solana uses a parallel execution environment compared to Ethereum single kind of threaded execution environment. And so kind of in order for Solana to process transactions in parallel, it has to make sure it's in kind of creating conflicts between these transactions that's processing at the same time. And the way Solana decides to go about this is that it uses these account lists as kind of a safety measure of saying that, you know, if two transactions are being processed at the same time, then they better not have overlapping account lists. And then you kind of get these safety guarantees and execution. And so kind of what that means from a fee perspective is that when transactions are getting included, they're not kind of only bound by the fee the kind of user submits. They're also bound by this account list, basically. So in an Ethereum world, we're kind of, if your transaction pays the base fee, there's space in the block, it can be included. That's not necessarily true in Solana in the case that if there's too much kind of contention on certain accounts that you might want to interact with, even if you're paying kind of their base fee, um, you might still not get included. And I guess kind of one other detail is that whereas Ethereum has a base fee that's basically um, kind of charging you per kind of gas unit you're using, in Solana they call gas CU, um, but there's not a similar thing if there's a base fee per CU. And so there's kind of just a fixed base fee per the amount of signatures a transaction verifies. The idea being that kind of the signature verification is kind of one of the costliest overheads of actually executing a transaction. The charging for just that is kind of a good proxy. Um, this has some unintended side, side, uh, side effects, um, which I think is kind of part of the reason the community is kind of, kind of discussing ways to kind of build upon the fee mechanism. Um, but kind of just like at a very high level, the way the, the fee mechanism works today is that there kind of just is a static fixed base fee. So it's also not dynamic like Ethereum's is. So it's not kind of shifting up and down based off of current demand. It's kind of a fixed fee per signature your transaction verifies. Um, and if you pay this, kind of that's all you need to be considered valid. And then there is still an optional priority fee per C unit you use. And so in times of contention, you know, users might decide to actually utilize this kind of priority fee to have a higher chance of being included to kind of, you know, incentivize the person building the block to pick up their transaction. Um, and so at a high level, the fee mechanism is actually like very simple in that sense, if it's only doing these two things. If it's only, it's only consists of a static base fee that's not changing per signature verification and an optional priority fee per CU that you use. I think the, the tricky thing is kind of some of the things you mentioned about like how Solana actually builds blocks in a continuous manner and in a parallel manner. And so kind of to start with um, some of the initial concerns that come from it building in a parallel manner, in order to actually make sure that um, every block is kind of fully using Full utilizing the parallelization, Solana has an additional constraint from just kind of the total amount of CU a block uses to an additional constraint in the total amount of CU any account can actually use. So for some concrete numbers, kind of every Solana block is 48 million CU, and they say no trend, no account can have more than 12 million CU kind of use it in a block, right? And so the idea being that Sonic kind of expects its validators today to have four, at least four threads to be used for execution. And so by kind of capping out any individual count at this kind of one fourth of the total block space, uh, kind of you some extent guarantee that like you can still execute uh, this full block in parallel and not, you know, you can imagine some kind of very adversarial blocks where if every transaction was interacting with the exact same piece of state, it might have to be processed serially and you kind of lose all these benefits of parallelization. And so that's why Solana adds some of these different constraints on like kind of 
different accounts and not just have only kind of a total block space constraint. But this then has some effects on fees. And so to one extent, it's kind of helpful and that's kind of what causes this phenomenon of local fee markets um, that kind of Sana has discussed before, kind of informally in that, you know, when a validator is solving their optimal block packing problem, um, since they have to respect these additional constraints on per accounts, um, for certain accounts, like say for an NFT drop or something, if this account is getting tons of hits, maybe above its 12 million limit, then the kind of person building that block is going to start wanting higher fees um, to like kind of get in the queue for that account compared to the rest of the block, maybe that's not as contentious, maybe it's just kind of payments and transfers back and forth. So there actually is ample block space there where there's not as much contention and then users don't need to pay the same kind of priority fee. And so I, I'd say kind of the way it's implemented today is a bit ad hoc um, and kind of kind of just relies on the validator or the person building the block kind of following these vague incentives to solve the block packing problem somewhat optimally to kind of infer these prices. Um, I think there's ways you can improve on how you can do this to make kind of a more explicit market to some extent, like kind of how the same way kind of VIP1559 says like, here's kind of like a base fee that like, you know, you can pay this, you can definitely get in. That's not really the case in Sonnet because of these kind of accounts that might be more or less contentious. And you can imagine different models that say, here is actually an explicit fee for certain accounts. And if you pay this fee for this account, like you'll definitely get in. And like, here's this menu of fees that you can, you know, you can add or choose or pick from basically, um, depending on what accounts you might want to interact with. And so basically, yeah, just the fact that kind of this thing is happening, the thon has to work in a parallel execution environment, makes this whole problem, how do you allocate block space a lot more complicated and in turn has effects in the fee market. That is a big reason why the community is kind of looking to see if there's ways you can improve on the current state. Yeah, I would say um, I've got a lot more to to dive in there, but you know, for folks, folks, and might be if they're not as familiar with some of the me the mechanisms of Solana, that spam is a massive problem, right? This is the sort of okay if you don't have a more um, sort of granular and restrictive policy for pricing your compute, you lower the fee. Then ultimately, when you're going to get is a lot of spam. So for the last two years, what Solana has spent their time doing is trying to keep design a system where you can keep the fees low. Uh, but still, you know, get all the benefits of an extremely fast pool. So that's where you have things like local fee markets, which are because you have to specify state upfront, then a bunch of the transactions that aren't touching contested state can kind of just go through in their regular cheap way. But you could almost imagine sort of mini auctions that are happening uh, time for those contest contested pieces of state. Um, but, you know, as you were alluding to, oh, sorry, go Sam. I, I just want to like interject one one little thing about spam, which I which I think is missed sometimes, but but ends up being kind of crucial, which is we, we kind of listed out a, a number of resources that the network provisions. And um, you know, in those were uh, block space itself, kind of inclusion and uh, the and, and bandwidth. And um, these are actually separate uh, separate resources. They're they're kind of like related but separate. And so um, performing a DDoS attack on a uh, specific validator um, costs nothing actually uh, it, in any blockchain really uh, the it, it just costs whatever co you know, the botnet costs um, because you can ping their rpc with anything um, so the the way that validators typically try to defend against that is by having some degree of redundancy or like uh, 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 setups in in multiple locations, um, using caching and and uh, there's like a number of different defensive measures. Um, uh, there's also spam for inclusion in the block, uh, and and uh, access to state. And this is what um, what Solana has really been laser focused on. Um, but it, it's just important to kind of disentangle these two because. Um, they can't be solved by the same mechanism. Um, they, they actually need to be treated uh, independently and um, and priced as as such. And I also one interesting thing Sana does on kind of the first of those attacks in network level. It actually does require. Um, so I'm not as familiar with kind of the network details of Sana, but they do require kind of RPCs to stake a certain amount to some extent. Or that details aren't quite like that. But basically, you know, validators kind of kind of distribute transactions uh, based off kind of stake weighted or the, kind of the, the network topology of how networks kind of propagate 
through different nodes, um, nodes with kind of higher stakes get more messages. And so if you're like a fully unstaked RPC or something, you can't actually spam a validator because a validator might only open, say, like, you know, 5% or 10% of their kind of bandwidth towards listening to you versus listening to the other people who actually have stake to some extent. So I, I think there's a different, there is a different mechanism Solana uses to kind of use some of the economics around staking to get around the spam problem. But yeah, it's definitely, diff there definitely is a separate concern of kind of MEV type spam of people looking at in the back of the block or something. That's interesting. I, I want to just bookmark that exact concept and that will sort of be not exactly related, but you can squint at it and see something very similar to this idea of feet credits actually that'll, that'll come, uh, later. So, all right, w walk us through, uh, because one of the, um, like there's a lot of sort of agitation around builders to revamp fee markets within Solana. And we talked about how it doesn't necessarily make sense. And one of the ways that Ethereum, I don't know if it's fair to call aired, it was just, it was always going to be trial and error. But, um, you know, when there was a one to one copy of Bitcoin's fee market to Ethereum's fee market, it didn't work because the blockchain had a very different vision for what it wanted to be uh, proof of work versus proof of stake, all this, all this stuff, right? So, Walk us through kind of what are the what are the key pain points from the perspective of builders and entrepreneurs on the Solana blockchain, and then like how can we start to solve that? Like how which parts of one five five nine do we want to borrow, if any? Which parts would break or be less applicable? And kind of like guide us through towards solution land a little bit. So I think one key part of how the markets end up looking like from UX perspective is how hard they make the block production problem. And so this is also the difference between the fact that Solana has 400 milliseconds versus Ethereum, you have 12 seconds to build a block. And so, so okay, so for Ethereum, when you're building a block um, as a block producer, you just want to kind of include every transaction that hits your base fee and kind of the highest number of those. This isn't too hard algorithmically. Uh, you can kind of just say, okay, like I have until maybe eight seconds in the slot to finally propose something. Let me just listen. Here, like I'll, I'll sort everything. You know, I'm just tracking this one compute number. Um, and as long as you know I'm like below the the maximum number, it's fine. And so it makes kind of just adhering to the the block or the kind of the EIP one five nine mechanism not too hard and kind of incentive compatible and all these kind of nice things. On Solana, that's not the case at all. Just because of this kind of, and so first of all, it's four milliseconds with a much higher kind of throughput. So you're having to just like pack transactions way more quickly. And the second thing is you do have to respect this kind of like parallel execution environment. And so what that means is the block production um, actually has this thing of the scheduler, basically that's like kind of baked into the client today, but you can imagine different ways to do this. And so the scheduler basically has to listen to incoming transactions and then kind of just like pack them immediately and then kind of like maintain some state of like what accounts are currently locked because you know, transactions being processed or writing to those accounts, what transactions aren't locked, you know, use different kind of priority queues and like different types of on transactions touching different accounts and making sure they get scheduled and this is all happening very fast. And so you can imagine sometimes like things fall through the cracks of like, you know, somebody sets a very high fee, but kind of the scheduler was like in between cycles and kind of, you know, blocked that transaction for some reason because some other transaction came in just half a second before that's being processed. Now he just has to wait a bit. And, you know, so like, so things like this can happen just because it's just more technically kind of demanding to build these blocks and it has to happen much quicker. And so the same kind of guarantees that you might get from just simply saying, you know, have a, have a base fee, stick a priority fee on it. And the Prince of makes money, they'll definitely include it. Yeah, a bit trickier to reason about um, on Solana. I think especially this local fee market thing definitely makes things harder too. Of you can't actually just say like, look at this base fee, pay it and get in. Um, you as a person kind of submitting transaction, you know, whether that's like a DAP developer kind of figuring out how they should structure a smart contract or like a user kind of submitting some type of trade, you have to kind of be cognizant of, Hey, like, look at the network right now. Like there's not a team happening that's on this exchange or maybe, or like there's some other thing happening. People are very active in this kind of local state. I better put some priority fee on it to make sure it gets through. And I, I think kind of the way that just because of how hard the underlying block production problem is, uh, the way that production problem actually respects how much you're putting on fees um, is not super great. So kind of in Solana world, we're almost like in Ethereum in the pre-1559 world of where people are kind of having to guess in their first price auction sense of like, 
you know, like how much priority fee really should I put uh, to actually get it included? And one nice thing is kind of the absolute amount of these fees in dollar terms is way lower. So it's not as much of a concern. It's not like, oh, do I have to pay $10 or $20 for a swap? It's like, oh, maybe do I have to pay like, you know, one tenth of a cent versus two tenths of a cent. And so that's why it's not like quite as painful. Um, and that, you know, as a user, maybe you're willing to like kind of like max click this priority fee. Um, but I think it, we still haven't seen kind of all the different kind of ecosystem players in Solana in terms of like wallets and different dApps to this extent, kind of like fully kind of figure out how they're dealing with priority fees. I think there's like some kind of default set, which then influences this kind of behavior of, you know, if everybody else is setting these relatively low priority fees, and I also don't have to set that much of a higher priority fee, but you can imagine games start to emerge. Once everybody starts really fully playing the first price auction, then things can kind of start to break down. And so I think things have generally worked fine um, with like you know UX annoyances, um, but yeah, it's part of the reason I think the community is trying to revamp these is to kind of foresee these problems that might come ahead um, with people starting to play various games with priority fees and different ways to kind of abuse the fact that the block production problem is harder um, to get an advantage and to figure out how we can make mechanisms ahead of time that kind of can stop some of these concerns. So what do you, do you get the sense that, you know, like I, Sam and I talked a little bit about this actually before the episode, but uh, in 1559, which now I think it, with the benefit of hindsight is one of the most successful upgrades to a live major blockchain in history, uh, there was a period of kind of despondence, right? For a while in, the, in that group chat, right? Sam, you said it got pretty, pretty bleak there. And there was even Vitalik, right? Himself was like, I don't think we're ever going to get this passed. This is just way too much. And, uh, I, you know, that's, that's one of the challenges of making a, you know, the whole value proposition of a blockchain is that it's supposed to be, if not immutable, very difficult to change, like the constitution of the United States. The value is that it's changeable, but the uh, threshold, the activation threshold is very high. So, you know, what's your sense, uh, Pranav, maybe on the Solana front, and then we can get into some other sort of cool areas of, of where people are like multidimensional fee markets, things like that. Like, what is your sense of the urgency of you know, rejiggering the fee market? Like how likely are we to get a major upgrade? Is it going to happen next year, years from now? Like, I know that's a really difficult sort of leading question, but you know, what's, what's your sense of um, the priority? Also, the community? When something goes wrong, you know, when there is a delay, I'd, I'd be interested to know like the, the material impact of that is like, are you waiting like a second now or what does that look like? Yeah. So I mean, just to answer the delay part first quickly, I think it's, um, I think it depends on exactly what type of adapter you're using because it's also up to kind of how your wallet or something deals with this of like, does it just send it and it fails and nothing happens? Um, does it actually somewhat like tell you to like resend these things? Um, honestly, I'm not like that plugged into like the execution layer, like details of how different apps deal with it. So I, I think for some people it's annoying, for some people it gets fixed and it's kind of fine. Um, I, I think it's like definitely like a pain point, but it's not like a, it doesn't like make the chain unusable by any means. It just makes certain tasks kind of hard to deal with at certain times. Um, in terms of the urgency of kind of upgrading the fee market, I, I think like as of the past few months, there's been kind of a rise in the community thinking this is more of an issue and kind of talking and discussing kind of in, like, you know, this in their discord and figuring out like how we can kind of update this stuff. Um, honestly, timelines, I. <laughs> Not very sure. Uh, I personally approach this up from a more academic angle a lot of times, honestly, of kind of just thinking about what are the properties you want and can we just like figure out the mechanism design really well and then leave implementation up to the others. Um, so that's probably more of a Solana Labs question, but like a, the time span of like a year, a couple of years, it seems reasonable to me, but really not quite sure. This is such a funny human thing, but the time that it's easiest to fix this would be right now, today when the ecosystem is still relatively small and before it's a huge problem. But this is just how human nature works. We're probably just going to have to wait for something to break or for it to become a massive problem. And then we'll, the community will come together and fix it, I would say, if I had to make a prediction there. Um, I, I want to expand and maybe use the, the rest of our time to talk about some cool new ideas around fee markets that haven't necessarily come into practice yet, but they are in the fore. And the it feels most obvious to start here around this idea of multi-dimensional fee markets. And this has been an idea that's been kicked around for a little while. But 
Uh, so Vitalik has wrote about the potential for um, multidimensional 1559. And uh, Tarun recently gave a really great talk. He actually wrote a larger paper with Theo Demondis on the subject as well of multidimensional fee markets. And uh, it's basically, maybe Sam, I could uh, poke at you to give us a description of this because you described gas, like the bundling of these sort of orthogonal resources um, into this magically into this one resource called gas. And now people are talking about actually unbundling that and charging more granularly for different resources. So you just give us an overview of what multidimensional fee markets mean. Yeah, hundred um, percent. Unbundling is, is like exactly the right uh, lens to bring to this. So um, when you're thinking about, so, so take storage, for instance, storage is a resource that um, is super important to the Ethereum network. Um, so state growth and um, the storage, the amount of storage uh, that uh, the protocol believes that um, Ethereum validators uh, should maintain uh, impacts the, the block size, the amount of gas. Um, so that it, it's crucial element to um, how, uh, yeah, how gas is, is computed. Um, that happens over this like the time scale of years, decades. You know, we, we want the Ethereum network to, to be able to like manage its state growth indefinitely. Um, when you're talking about inclusion or like a network resource, it's it's like an instantaneous resource. And so you need to price uh, the, the gas abstraction is like a singular object that is trying to to incorporate all of these different elements that happen over many different time scales or, and impact actors in different ways. So multidimensional fee mar markets, the, the main concept is to, to try to uh, break up um, the pricing model and say, okay, well, what if we can just uh, more directly pinpoint storage and say, this is what it costs the network to grow states at this rate. And, um, and then we can look at, at uh, networking and, and say, okay, this is the, the kind of immediate cost that's uh, uh, induced by uh, demand here. And, and then we can create a, a kind of composite value um, in, in this kind of like more granular way. And, and so we can create like abstractions over them. And um, the, the direction that this, this paper that you're in, uh, alluding to, Mike, um, the multidimensional fee markets paper, it is basically about creating some kind of um, optimization function across these uh, different allocation schemes in order to um, to kind of best uh, price individual resources. Um, but yeah, one one of the important things to take away from this is that like there is actually a uh, from the protocol designer's perspective, there there actually is like a, a preference mechanism that's baked into the protocol. Like this is how um, it, in Solana, you actually see this, like there, there's a preference for utilization of all cores at once. And um, Solana could actually charge for uh, serialized transactions. They, they, like the network might actually be able to like um, uh, pull in more revenue or pull, pull in more transaction fees by doing that. But uh, there, that is kind of not the allocation preference of of the protocol, like we, we want to actually push uh, utilization into these uh, into these four cores at once. Um, so that kind of like general direction of uh, identifying specific resources and um, creating really a, a more uh, opinionated or or like a larger space of allocation mechanisms is is kind of like the the general theme that that I would identify. Yeah, if I had to, uh, you know, the, what what sort of struck me is if you go back to one five five nine, the what they were optimizing for is a UX upgrade, but there wasn't much thought to how can we efficiently allocate, um, you know, allocate resources within the within the network. And this is the the multi dimensional aspect of it is how can we optimize for using all of our resources in the most efficient way and price as such. And uh, sorry. I have a just funny anecdote, which is uh, 
I, I have heard that many of the Ethereum opcode uh, gas prices are based on Vitalik just basically doing benchmarks on his like laptop at the time. And these cannot be recreated because like the laptop doesn't exist anymore. And it's like very specific to a, you know, a model of machine with like specific configuration. Um, so those are, uh, th those have a, a few of them have been updated over time. Um, these, you know, there's EIPs to do this kind of thing, but a lot of this, uh, like, why is it priced this way is just based on this like crazy artifact of like, yeah, the talk just benchmarked it on, on his machine and that, that's what it was. And it, it's actually kind of the same in, in Cosmos. Uh, Dave Woja did a bunch of benchmarking and, and a lot of the gas pricing, uh, uh, I think Dave and Chris, um, did, did a bunch of the benchmarking and a lot of that's just kind of stayed, um, because nobody's revised it. That's an awesome anecdote. I used to be a, a management consulting or a management consultant actually in a past life. And there's a lot of theory about pricing in general, but what I sort of figured, figured out is most pricing is just, and, uh, what feels good. Uh, that, that is my very scientific description of how most, most pricing ends up happening. So yeah, I think, I think it's a, and it, it actually, there's a, I don't have it up on, but if, if you go and listen to the, watch the Tarun talk on YouTube, I think they have this in the, in the paper as well, but. You can actually very clearly see they show you the picture, like a very simplified sort of uh, example where you can imagine a utility function for users. So let's just call it arbitrarily like three, right? And in this block, there's two different resources, call it compute and storage. And if you have, uh, and let's say the utility function for the whatever action requires the storage versus the compute is very different. And you could imagine gas having to be an average that. The utility isn't necessarily maximized where if you can price those resources differently, you can actually like sort of use those resources more efficiently. This isn't going to make sense until you look at the picture. Go look at the picture. But uh, it's it's a very interesting problem. And one question that I have for the two of you, and maybe Pranava, I'll start with you first, is it's, it's very interesting. You can imagine in an Ethereum context, I don't know how this might work, but just <laughs> I feel like if you combine the local fee markets on Solana with the multi-dimensional fee markets does that unlock some kind of new design space or what is possible to do in in a solana context that might be more difficult from an ethereum context so i would actually say that local fee markets are multi-dimensional fee markets um and they're kind of just like a different way of saying the same thing of what's really happening with local fee markets is you can imagine that every account is a different resource basically and we have to meter account usage basically to get the parallelization properties we want um, and in that way, kind of having your transaction be priced, not only for how much compute it uses, but in particular about what parts of state and what accounts it's touching is the multidimensional nature of it. I think it also makes it a bit harder to get all the, the incentives right, is that you can imagine two different versions of this multidimensional fee market. And then the first ones where, where your resources are like really non-fungible things like, you know, compute, storage, bandwidth. Like there's ways you can rewrite transactions or like smart contracts to use these different things in different ratios, but there's certain things that have to go in storage. There's certain things that have to be computed and you can't get around this. Whereas when your resources are actually just different accounts, that's not quite the same of like, in this really something you have to use certain accounts, but you can use accounts much more creatively than you can, might, you, or in sense you can manipulate accounts much more creatively than you might be able to manipulate kind of storage. And in some sense, um, you know, when you only have maybe like say three or four different resources in the Ethereum world, maybe that you're doing multidimensional fees over these, just like three base resources, the demand for those resources should be like fairly stable, you know, they'll like shift over time. Um, and as things happen, um, you can adjust those prices, but when you go to like a kind of per account basis, this looks much harder and that, you know, the demand for just certain parts of state can shift dramatically over the course of a second, you know, when an FT drop happens, all of a sudden there's just one account that has tons and tons of demand on it. Um, in a way that's like, you wouldn't really go from like, oh, there's no storage. Now there's tons of storage. I mean, you know, maybe things like inscriptions or something happen, but like generally you wouldn't like expect these kind of base resources to have this massive fluctuation where you might have for accounts. And so I, I think kind of sauna has basically already agreed to do multi-dimensional fees by going down this local fee market route. And the question is, how can they really tune this to be as good as possible 
when your resources are explicitly every separate account and not these kind of more base level compute level type resources. Mm. Yeah, that actually sets up this B credits concept quite well. It, it's yep. if you use Gwent edit, it's actually kind of the same thing, but it um, th there's really two differences. So this is a concept that um, uh, some of the Osmosis team um, published on recently. Uh, Dave and Alpin um, from Osmosis, and it's really a uh, you know a local fee market where each user has their own fee market, and there is a dynamic allocation scheme or pricing scheme based on specific application behavior. Um, and uh, really, the main idea is okay. Okay, I am creating kind of like a um, uh, non-transferable nft this is my you know my singular account i can build up um credits um by performing certain transactions and those can be used um to within the uh the pricing calculation for my my specific uh transaction so um if you want to uh you know give all you know give give specific nft holders um uh kind of free transactions for a day you, you could do that um you know there's a it's like black friday sale um this is like obviously not something that a a kind of global um uh or like global smart contract platform would uh would implement it's very application specific it's very opinionated um but it is about kind of like tuning the allocation scheme um to elicit certain user behavior so you, you could imagine actually negative fees you could say okay i i get um some rebates by performing certain transactions um and uh, induce user behavior that way uh you can have you can make it so that users don't actually need uh the, the gas token um they actually get a free uh free transaction if they uh if they meet certain criteria so um, there's ways that you can kind of tune this to uh, uh, encourage uh, repeat behavior um, that may be useful to the application. Um, so uh, the allocation scheme here is like maybe I want to use the DEX. Um, and that, that's really the, the thing I'm trying to optimize for is just utilization of the DEX, not utilization of the chain. Uh, no, I, it's just it's really interesting, Sam, because, you know, <laughs> There are, this is why I just think it's so important to pay attention to multiple ecosystems because you can kind of squint and see everyone's trying to solve very similar problems. And you brought up the idea of a rebate. So one idea, actually, this is a uh, sort of controversial, it's getting a lot of uh, attention within the Solana community is a uh, SIMD0016. Uh, um, and the title is Program Rebatable Account Right Fees or PRA, PRA fees. And basically the idea is that right now you could basically mandate that there's a fee um, by writing to a certain, uh, you know, write locking a certain account, and then the owner of that account can decide to rebate the fee uh, if they want, and they can decide to do that to organic users, but the fee would still be applicable even for tra failed transactions. So you could punish spam users. So a very similar concept, also very similar to a QoS weighted uh, stake, where basically this is a, a form of spam prevention where the Solana network says, hey, uh, you know, if you have, I'm only going to open up my bandwidth to other RPCs that have X percentage of stake, you can kind of squint at it and see it's all the same sort of thing, actually. Um, and it's all about, maybe to bring it home, I think one of the other optimization problems that doesn't get talked about enough within the context of fee markets is optimizing for organic fees as opposed to spam type fees. And that's another massive design principle that you can see throughout each of these ecosystems as well. But I find it so interesting. It also, it sort of blurs the line as well. Like Sam, you and I have talked about this quite a bit in between this kind of spectrum of sovereignty, right? Where mm -hmm. you have kind of like on Ethereum, like a DAP on Ethereum and then a full stack Cosmos app chain. And then maybe in the middle, you have like the OP stack, um, you know, law of chains or whatever they're calling it. And then maybe a sovereign rollup fits somewhere on there that settles down to Celestia. And then maybe there's like almost account level sovereignty where if Solana on a, on a generalized basis wanted to grant more 
uh, discretion to the owners of accounts and the powers that are afforded to them. It all sort of just exists on this this spectrum. And it's super interesting. Profies look a lot like lanes that we've been doing in Cosmos and, and Ethereum's kind of looking at as well. Um, but I guess Pros, as far as I understand, is like a little bit more of a generic uh, solution. And at least how we've been doing it is like much more enshrined. Like, okay, you have a DEX chain, you want your DEX transactions to be here, you want your re uh, undelegation transactions to be in this this lane. Mm. Well, maybe we could end this um, on, you know, I know we've got like five minutes left here before we got to wind down, but Sam, you've been dealing with perhaps the most complex optimization problem in within Cosmos of many different chains that have different fee markets, many different currencies. Um, you know, I guess in the limited time that you have, like, can you kind of walk us through any lessons learned and, you know, I guess just like sort of broad implications of what we're talking. Like, is it, how important is it for different chains or protocols or however you want to define it to maintain sovereignty over their own fee markets is are there going to be a million different fee markets across a million currencies and it's all going to be abstracted are we going to have more global solutions like you know how do you see this sort of evolving yeah i i mean i, I don't know how i see it evolving like uh across all ecosystems but i can't speak to cosmos so cosmos is uh one thing for listeners to, to know is that um, obviously Cosmos is like a set of independent blockchains, um, common networking protocol, but each of those blockchains typically has their own staking token and they use that staking token for fees. Um, so, uh, and then not only be because they're sovereign, they also like uh, get to select their own fee mechanism. So in order to to abstract across all these things, you need to solve a, a multi-domain fee pay, payment solution. So you have, you have tokens on one chain. I need to I want to use those to pay tokens on or to pay a fee on the other chain, but my tokens aren't on that chain. So like, how do I? There's like a chicken and egg problem there. And then, um, uh, not only that, but <laughs> the tokens that I have on this chain aren't aren't the required uh, tokens for fee payment on the other chain. So I, I actually need to, to do an exchange, um, at the same time. Uh, and then the, and then you like, once you've solved that problem, which Cosmos has not done sufficiently, it's like a lot of the stuff that I'm working on. It's just figuring out the plumbing of how to make that work. What, once you have gotten to that point, then you can say, okay, well, uh, given the exchange rate of X and, uh, you know, actually being able to, to pay in the right domain, um, what is the the pricing scheme? And I need to know how that chain um, has set up their fee market um, or how, uh, you know, some of the things that I've been trying to think about is like, can we unify these at all? Um, can we make it so that um, there is a way for, uh, you could almost imagine kind of like a, a free trade zone or something like that, where there's um, there's like a unified um, mechanism of payment, uh, or uh, uh, you know, I'll let your your users pay at this rate if you let my users pay at this rate, and like we can we can do business together. Um, and so yeah, there's very likely going to be in order to kind of solve this all together. There's a combination of several different. Um, features, technologies that, that I imagine will be kind of blended together. And a lot of people have been kind of flowing into Cosmos recent, recently, which has been really fun. Um, a lot of them are like, damn, this is really complicated. What the hell is going on? Um, uh, but yeah, like we know, and uh, there, there's kind of like solutions in the pipeline. Um, it's kind of amazing that it works at all right now. Um, and uh you know if anybody wants to talk about that more or like has issues you know you should come and chat sam and skip are putting the entire team on their back so uh big <laughs> big big ups to you sam and uh and what you're doing at skip um guys uh i know in our, in our last couple minutes anything that we that we missed that you wanted to leave listeners with about fee markets or we can just 
wind down and um and yeah guys this this was a huge this was really fun for me sam knows i've been trying to put this together for like a month um so this has been this has been great uh from my perspective i hope that we maybe added a little bit of nuance to the two camps that tend to talk past each other on fees and just made people think a little bit more critically about it uh going forward but um pranav or sam uh, you guys are both uh, great if folks want to find out more about either the work you're doing or follow you or or whatever what is the what is the best way to do that yeah i, I think for me just um twitter basically um so just kind of was at p garden meeting just p and then my last name um and yeah i'll be posting papers different thoughts um blog post papers in the future yeah awesome yeah and same for me uh, if you want to find me on twitter at at hxrts um, and if you do have some inclination to, to play around with Cosmos, I would recommend um, visiting ibc.fun, um, which is kind of our like demo uh, experience, which I think at least does a pretty good job of like abstracting over uh, many chains, many tokens. Um, so it, it is doable. Yeah, it does. Thank you for having me. You bet, guys. This one was a lot of fun. Uh, hope, hope everyone you're full of... Uh... You know, whatever holiday food you celebrate, eat full bellies and you get to listen to some nerds talk about fee markets. Uh, that's what it's all about. Um, <laughs> all right, guys, this was a ton of fun. Thank you both for coming on. Great. Thanks for having me.